Hi everyone. Thank you for joining the fourth session of our final Transform event, Transform the Circular Economy, and welcome. My name is Laura Berry, and I will be your EMC today for today's session with Roseanne Stevens and Fiona Smitty. As you may know, the Transform series is a new online seminar that explores the growing impact of digital transformation on business and society. We'll be covering a total of six areas, ranging from the future of work to smart cities and communities, the circular economy, and many more. Today, however, we're looking at the sixth of these areas by focusing on how digital technologies are impacting the circular economy. We're delighted to be joined by Roseanne Stevens, Whole Food Chef and author, and Fiona Smithy of Green Outlook. So Roseanne will be discussing food waste and giving us a live zero waste demo, and Fiona will be giving you all some insights into sustainable products. Feel free to send in your questions during the session using the Q&A function. You'll find it at the bottom of your screen. And please be aware that the chat function is disabled, so only use the Q&A tab. We will then compile the questions and I will ask Roseanne and Fiona to address as many as they can in the time available. So I'm looking forward to your questions and please just remember to use the Q&A function as the chat is disabled. So without further delay, I'll hand you over to the panel and introduce Roseanne Stevens, Whole Food Chef and author. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for that lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. I, I know you've shared my bio with everyone, but just to give a quick little rundown and intro so that what I'm speaking about makes a little bit more sense to everybody. So I am South African by birth, but I've lived many years in Ireland, hence the accent, the weird hybrid accent that I have. So that, um, explains that. So I've worked as a whole food chef for many years, which means my training is literally in um, butter fresh produce, beans, lentils, chickpeas, um, sea seaweed, you know, your sea vegetables and really unprocessed food. So that would be my culinary background. I've taught cooking for many, many years and I actually now do that online. But a number of years ago, I actually teamed up with DCU to create a zero waste test kitchen. So our primary function is to prevent food waste at a catering industry level. So in places like colleges, hotels, um, event centers, hospitals, so on and so forth. That would be the main body of work that we do. And um, so that, that would be shared with other universities and we each take a component of various different projects that we are taking part in. So from the outset, my research institute is called Newsphere. So from the outset, I made sure that I really thought about what the goals and aims were and what the social enterprise would be rooted in. So looking at the United Nations SDGs, I know DCU is very strong on incorporating the SDGs for assignments and projects and a lot of the work that we do as a campus and at a college and a student level. Looking at the 17 SDGs, all of them are applicable. There's no one that is more important than the other. But when it comes to what areas you specifically focus in as, um, as an entity, I decided to focus on SDG number three, which is human health and well-being, and SDG uh, number 12, which is responsible consumption. So my main role is to find the harmonious intersection between those two. How can we look after human health and planetary health and what are the commonalities how can we achieve that common goal bearing in mind all the other different sdgs as we go along so when it comes to food it is a very very complex conversation as i'm sure you will agree incredibly complex and there's so many different aspects of life and academia and science and arts disciplines that come into it so we're not so much going to touch on that today but really on the human health and planetary health part of it. So from a human health part, what I primarily focus on is how to create recipes and diets that improve the gut flora and fauna, the microbiome, your gut health as such. So when it comes to gut health, the one thing that has proven to be the most effective 
is to increase the range of plant foods that we eat. So that marries very well with planetary health. So you can see that intersection right there. So a study suggests that for the maximum benefit to have a long lasting and beneficial change to your gut microbiome is to have 30 different plant foods in your diet a week. So that might seem completely excessive and going, I don't do that. That's, that's absolutely crazy. How am I going to do that? So it does take some creativity and some planning. So this would include your, your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains, your beans, your lentils, your chickpeas, and your sea vegetables. So it includes the whole plant kingdom and your nuts and your seeds and your, your nut butters and things. So once you start looking at it, you can slowly build that up. But then to again marry it with planetary health, this then will improve biodiversity and hopefully people exploring new plant foods and also different species of plant foods that are about being cultivated. So for instance, there is a, um, an Irish agriculture um, organization called Bi uh, Biotonics that are doing amazing things, cultivating various different tubers that are suitable for the Irish climate. And the fibers in these particular vegetables have particular health benefits, like fibers like inulin for our gut health. So there's lots of different tangential um, aspects to this. And, interesting projects and really fascinating people doing various things when it comes to um, looking at our planetary health and biodiversity. So what I really focus on when it comes to food waste is not so much the end of life food waste, as say for instance, turning vegetable peelings into various different dishes or recipes. I very much focus on preventing the food waste before that happens. So there's a lot of different strategies that we use. On a catering level, we use um, AI and cameras and quite sophisticated software to analyze where the food waste is actually happening. And from that aspect, we then look at preventing it. And you can do something similar in your domestic environment at home to figure out what things you're buying every week that you are routinely wasting and throwing it in the bin. And the answer isn't, to compost it or to feed it to the dog or to feed it to the pigs in the farm, the answer is to not purchase that food to begin with. Because one of the reasons we really look at preventing food waste is that we are upsetting the food chain. You are sending messages up that food chain that we need to carry on producing um, this food because Mary and John buy it every week and they need to have it. So we need to stop sending that message up the food chain. But probably the most important reason why food waste is such a massive problem is that the methane that's produced from food rotting, you know, out in fields and landfill is the third largest contributor to global warming on the planet. So number one reason would be climate change. Then there are aspects like world hunger we currently produce enough calories in the world and enough food for everyone to have a more than adequate diet, but that's obviously not being distributed properly. And then again, problems with the food chain that we really causing these massive problems with the food chain. And then just sheer waste. Um, now, I don't think that sits well with anybody to waste food. So to get on with our recipe, what I'm gonna show you is a very accessible, very easy, cheesy broccoli baked potato, and um, super easy to make. Like I said, I very much focus on plant foods, but when you look at food waste, the greatest um, category of food that's wasted um, is fruits and vegetables. And we can break that down further into salad leaves and so on and so forth. So while we do want people to eat more of this, we're very, very conscious we don't want people um, to end up throwing in the bin. So there's lots of ways that we can maximize the use of that fruit and vegetable and not end up throwing it in the bin. So the different aspects we're maximizing today is we're eating a food that's in season. Broccoli is just coming into season, especially purple sprouting broccoli, which is fabulous. We're going to use um, different kind of knife skills, zero waste knife skills to minimize the waste that we are creating when we're preparing. And then when it comes to the actual dish itself, it is an excellent dish that can actually freeze. So that's a preservation method that's very, very effective. So freezing would be an excellent preservation method. So other things people think about would be fermented foods would be another one. And um, so all your fermented foods and your pickles and your preserves, it's a huge category. 
So that is another way of preventing food waste, but I like starting at this end of things. Now, if anybody's wondering how to get this recipe and other recipes, I actually have a weekly newsletter, free Substack, and each week is a different vegetable fruit. So this week is broccoli, it's going live tomorrow, some lovely recipes in it. It's called the Susty Lunchbox. So Susty is short for sustainable, but I'm sure you know that. Okay, so let's get cracking, and we're gonna start on the broccoli, all right? So two parts to the broccoli, I'm sure you know this. So this is the woody stalky bit. A lot of people would discard this. And the students will be too young to remember this, but back in the day when there was still Superquin, you'd have your loose broccoli, no plastic, and there'd be a little chainsaw, a little hacksaw thing, and you'd come across and you'd be allowed to hack off this bit, discard it, and then just pay for the head of broccoli. So that was um, sort of perceived value driven that the supermarket did it because Broccoli was sold by weight, so they didn't want you paying for this bit. Okay, so I'm sure you're all aware of this, especially from a circular economy point of view, is to support local Irish businesses. So we've got um, Fiona talking in a, in a little while as an excellent example of this. So I belong to the Dublin Food Co-op, and I'd encourage you to go and have a look at what they're doing. So that is an excellent example of a community um, food initiative. There's also an allotment um, on DCU campus. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that as well. There is a lot of community driven uh, food initiatives um, in Dublin and other parts of Ireland. So ideally, you will pick up your broccoli from somewhere like the Dublin Food Co-op or your local green grocer. And now there are delivery services for uh, fruits and vegetables and it will come plastic free. In an ideal world, that is what we want. So then how do we deal with this guy? I'm gonna show you to minimize the waste. All right, so number one thing, you're gonna put down a cloth, put a chopping board on top of it. The cloth prevents it from slipping and sliding. You can do this with a small knife or a big knife. Um, so a small knife, this is great. These little serrated knives are brilliant. I get my students to use these, both my kids, students and my adults. I'm gonna use a big knife. I'm allowed to use one of these. I'm literally just gonna take the very, very tip of it off. All right, this is woody, it's not pleasant, but I could add this to a soup because in water, it would soften up. So I could chop it up and pop it into a soup or I can pop it into my compost bowl. I definitely prefer composting to brown bins. I spent the year um, 2019 working on waste management in Ireland to the point where Dublin City Council nicknamed me Bin Bag Stevens. And let me just tell you, you need to compost, no brown bins. So I want to separate this guy from the florets because they're going to cook at different speeds all right check the outside that's nice and fresh looking if there's any little brown bits you can just um, chop them off so get as close to the florets as possible all right so those are going to cook separately the, this is going to cook for a little bit longer all right so i want to try and chop this as small as i can because this is quite woody and it's quite fibrous so cut it in long skinny strips first almost like batons fries, sort of a fry shape. You may not use French culinary terms, but that would be a baton shape. Gather it all together. Actually, this guy can cut one small. Really try and get it nice and fine, and then slide your knife across and get it into small little pieces. We're making up a topping for baked potato. It's absolutely delicious. Um, it's had great success with even with people who hate vegetables with a passion. So I do a lot of recipes that are vegan, that have got no animal um, proteins in whatsoever. But from a food waste point of view, I'm just gonna run my knife through this. We have found that good quality dairy, and um, preferably organic, um, is an excellent way to minimize food waste because it broadens your range of recipes that you can use. And then it's also more appealing um, to people who, would like a bit of dairy or eggs in their diet. That's if all the development I do at a catering level is all vegetarian. And I also specialize in special dietary needs. So um, if there are things that people can't eat or they're allergic to, we do really look at that. Okay, so that is one lot, okay? This is a little bench scraper that you use for pastry. Very handy for scooping up vegetables like this. So get those in. So that's going to cook first. 
This is also excellent. You, you can chop them even finer and you can make a broccoli salad. There's a broccoli salad included in the newsletter tomorrow. It's like an American slaw. Then your florets. This is a little bit time consuming. You can do this with your knife. You can do that and lob off that piece of stem, chop it up and add it there. Or you can literally click off these tiny little florets. So this is what you're gonna do if you're making that gorgeous broccoli salad I'm telling you about. It's a fabulous salad, it's actually my second cookbook. So you see this woody bit, and they add it in. Oopsie, so that goes with this one, okay? And you just carry on clicking them off. And if you see the way I'm chopping it and dealing with this, there's not broccoli everywhere. So instead of slicing into the head and you've got little bits of florets going everywhere, we're being nice and neat and tidy about it. And we're not wasting anything. We're literally not wasting anything. So we've got a big piece over here. So we'll just do him separately, chop him up and add it to that. Now, because we obviously want to save time for questions, I've got the, here's one I've done before. So you can see there, very little bits on the chopping board and you can just add that to your bowl. Okay. So that way, you're not, you're really not going to waste anything when it comes to that head of broccoli. So cooking broccoli, as people might be going, oh, I don't like broccoli, it doesn't taste good. Different ways of cooking it. Tender stem broccoli, as I was saying, is in season at the moment. Um, fantastic roasted. Just a little bit of olive oil, salt and pepper. Um, olive oil is an excellent um, oil to cook with. Roasted broccoli is phenomenal. Really, really, really good. You'll be a convert if you try roasted broccoli. What I've done is I've taken a steamer pot, okay, so pot, a little bit of water in it, and this is a steamer pot with little holes in it, and it comes with a tight fitting lid, okay? And you just steam the stems for a few minutes first until they're soft, and then you add the florets to it. But I'm gonna show you what you can do. If you don't have a steamer pot, you just take your ordinary pasta colander, I think everyone in the world has something that looks like this, okay? You put this on top of your pot, find any old pot lid and stick that on top and it'll work. Now, fair enough, some of the steam will escape, but that's fine. There's plenty of steam still to, to make it work, all right? So the filling for my topping, or well, the bulk of it, um, is gonna be the broccoli and we're gonna add a little bit of um, sour cream to it or creme fraiche. You can also use Greek yogurt, and you can really add pretty much any cheese that you have. So if you've got odds and ends of gouda, cheddar, some parmesan, pop it in there. We're going to flavor it up with some cayenne pepper, which is spicy. If you don't have this, chili flakes, hot sauce, bit of Tabasco, you can make it work. Um, red onion is going to go into it, and a little bit of Dijon mustard. So the main spicy flavors of it will be these two guys. Works really, really, really well with the broccoli. I'm going to show you how to chop an onion. So you can't do a cookery demonstration and not learn how to chop an onion. That would be a tragedy, all right? So back to the chopping board. You are going to take these little root guys off because they're just going to end up on your chopping board. Two sides to the onion. You're going to slice this bit off the top. That's where the stem grows out. As little as you can, okay? So compost bowl slice through the middle of the root. Take off all the papery leaves. These can actually be added to stocks. They give a nice depth of flavor. Onion skin gives a very nice depth of flavor to things, but in and of themselves, they're not good to eat. Okay. So just to explain to you, actually let me finish chopping this and I'll tell you something else. It's interesting and it's a different way of looking at food waste. I might be a little bit unpopular with some people saying it, but it has to be said. Now you're probably wondering what on earth she's saying. 2021 is my year of saying controversial things. So there we go. So we're gonna make two horizontal cuts, lots of vertical cuts, and that's gonna turn our onion into a little grid. And that's how we're gonna dice it. Actually, I got four out, it's quite a big onion. So that's half the grid. Lots of little vertical slices, and then if you slice straight down, voila, you have a little dice. Okay, 
super, super, super easy. And we don't want to waste any onion. So this last little bit, you just do this separately. So you make a little grid out of that end bit and you chop, chop, chop. So we're really not wasting anything. It's all perfectly edible, delicious, tiny little bit left. I'm gonna keep this bit of onion because it was a big onion. We don't need all of that. Okay, no way, I haven't forgotten about my unpopular opinion. I will share it with you in a moment. So our cheesy stuff we've got going on. Um, we've got some mozzarella and cheddar mix. I'm keeping a little bit for the top. Uh, then some creme fraiche or sour cream or yogurt and use what you have. So if you don't have enough, just mix a few bits and bobs together. Some feta cheese. I don't need all of that. And this is quite salty. So I'm just going to add black pepper to it. There we go. And then I need my spices. So cayenne pepper or your hot sauce or your chili flakes goes in about half a teaspoon of that and then Dijon mustard which is an essential what I call a pantry pal. In each of our cookbooks I talk about pantry pals. Pal as in friend if you don't understand my South African accent and those are things that are excellent to have in your pantry that means you can make delicious meals but also incredibly handy for um, zero waste cooking. So I, I call my junior chefs that I teach cookery classes to, I call my sasty chefs. So that's the cheesy deliciousness going on. So now we're going to add our steamed broccoli. Okay. Get that all out there and give this a good mixeroo. So you want to cook the broccoli until it's quite soft. At least the, the stalk part must be quite soft is we're imitating sort of a cauliflower cheese in a way, but with broccoli. So a bit more texture than a cauliflower cheese, but not super crunchy. Not the way I would normally cook my broccoli, which I leave it very, very crunchy. Okay. Just clearing, cleaning down, clean as you go, as I yell at all my, all my students. So where does the baked potato come in? You'll be wondering. Going, this, this woman said there'd be a baked potato, but I have yet to see a baked potato. All right. So I'm going to teach you some things. So this is a very ordinary rooster potato. Many, many, many more varieties um, available and grown in Ireland now and being experimented with. But from an accessibility point of view, um, something like this was easy for you to get. I par cook them in the microwave. So I poke a lot of holes in them and allow them to steam. Part of what we do um, in our research projects is we look at energy efficiency for different appliances. We look at air quality in kitchens and a lot of it has to do with cooking emissions, which is a huge problem um, in various countries around the world. And microwaves have proven to be very, very useful. So I par cook them, maybe four minutes per side, depending on how big it is. Chop it in half, okay. Now that's a fairly small, you know, that's a very average size potato. If you're very hungry, you can of course make two but you could do a whole bunch of these, say on a Sunday evening, because if a potato is cooked and then cooled, it changes the carbohydrate in it to what we call resistant starch. So it actually makes it far healthier to eat. It turns it into a slow releasing carb. A little bit of butter on it. You can't have a potato without a bit of butter. And I know we bang on about it, but Irish butter really is the best in the world. It's got the best nutrient profile, the best flavor. A little bit of salt. I like a good Irish sea salt. And then if you want the potato skin to go crispy, you can um, actually put a bit of olive oil um, on the outside. You can rub it in, or you can just drizzle a little bit into your dish. And there we go. So this will make eight cup size portions. And you can freeze it per cup size. That's what I do. It's a few minutes, very well spent. And then you have a fantastic, fantastic meal um, of a lunchtime or of an evening. So a little bit of extra cheese on the top. And then I'm gonna pop this into a hot oven. Or you can pop it into the grill as long as you watch, as long as you watch it. 
and that is going to melt the cheese and make it delicious and glorious and golden. So what have we done there? We've used a food that's in season that can be grown locally and um, that's incredibly nutritious. Um, all your green vegetables are incredibly nutritious. Uh, we've used uh, zero waste knife skills. So we've really maximized the use of the vegetable with wasting very, very little. We've also selected a preservation method because we're going to freeze that unless you gobble it all up at once. Um, we've also then looked at um, eating plant food and eating it um, in a different, new, fun and interesting way which will motivate us to, to carry on eating it. And um, yeah, so that is a very accessible little recipe in the newsletter going live tomorrow. So I really hope you enjoyed that. And if you have any questions, just pop it into the Q&A and um, Laura will manage all of that. So I'm going to unpin myself to so make sure I didn't, I've covered everything. Oh, yes, I forgot my best stat of the whole speech. How could I do that? I've only got five points and I forgot the best one. Okay, so when it comes to food waste statistics, we get very good quality research um, from uh, the EPA in Ireland, the Environmental Protection Agency. That's where a lot of our stats come from. But we are literally pound for pound, very, very similar to the UK. So I would often adopt their stats and just uh, convert it on a pro rata basis. So here's the stat, wait for it, okay? If every person in the UK didn't waste food for one day, it's the equivalent of taking 14,000 cars off the road for a full year. Okay, so I'll repeat that. If every single person in the UK didn't throw out food for one day, it's the equivalent of taking 14,000 cars off the road for a full 365 days. So I think that is definitely something to think about and the enormous impact that wasting food can have especially on a domestic level while we're all living at home predominantly we're working we're eating we're sleeping doing absolutely everything at home food waste has gone up by 40 percent in ireland since lockdown so you might think that you can't play a role in this you can't make a difference but you really 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 can okay so that's it for me from the moment when this comes out the oven i will show you the cheesy deliciousness um, but I'm going to hand you back to Laura. Thank you so much for your time and patience and attention. Thank you so much, uh, Rosanne. I'm feeling very inspired. And um, without further ado, we, I'll just pass you straight on to Fiona and then we can do a joint Q&A at the end. OK, thank you. Thanks, Laura. So I think Molly should be able to share my slides now. Um, if you hear my tummy rumbling, that's just because I have an appetite now after watching uh, Roseanne's um, beautiful uh, cooking demonstration. And I look forward to seeing uh, the uh, finished product after I've finished speaking. So um, we are in the midst of a climate crisis. The world is changing and we are changing with it. According to a 2019 PwC Irish Retail and Consumer Report, 41% of Irish consumers are prepared to pay a premium for sustainable products. My name is Fiona Smitty. I'm a chartered accountant and I am the founder of Green Outlook. And I'm so delighted to be here speaking with you today. I worked for a renewable energy company up until the middle of 2018. And unfortunately that company closed down, but I took that as an opportunity to go traveling. And I visited some beautiful countries, but I saw firsthand the impact of the climate crisis in certain places. So on the left, you'll see a picture of the San Blas Islands. And I met the community there and heard how they were making plans to move to mainland Panama due to the rising sea level. Um, the next picture then over is me on the glaciers in New Zealand. And I heard about how they were in constant retreat with the last few years. And on the right is Hong Kong. Obviously, the pollution from China where, you know, the, the famous um, made in China. Uh, so the pollution is in Hong Kong is quite apparent uh, nearly every day. And it's very rare that you would get a clear sky in Hong Kong. And this made me think about when I was living in Dublin and how I was, you know, 
I was earning an accountant salary. I was working very hard during the week. And at the weekend, I would take a trip down to Dundrum, probably more so out of just something to do. And I would take a trip into Pennies and Zara. And I wasn't really correlating what I was doing day to day, what I was eating day to day, how I was cooking day to day, what I was wearing day to day, and that environmental impact. So I came home and I realized that we have a lot of power in our pocket. So as Roseanne says, it's up to us to educate ourselves in the area of the sustainable development goals. This is something that's definitely becoming um, more talked about now and uh, fair play to DCU for putting on uh, this week's talk. And we all have a consumer uh, power then in the money that we spend, the businesses that we support, like uh, Roseanne again said about supporting Irish businesses and uh, I think the uptake in supporting Irish businesses towards the second half of 2020 was uh, great to see and I hope it will continue after COVID-19 because it's true supporting a small Irish business you're not only supporting that business you're supporting the ecosystem that it works with so all its suppliers um, you know if it's an accountant they work with if they get their packaging uh, the more money that goes back into the Irish economy the better so combining those I set up a business called Green Outlook and at Green Outlook, we curate a range of beautiful, natural, sustainable products to help people to make better choices in the products that they're buying. So at the moment, it's a self-funded business. So over the last two years, I've been growing the product range. And it includes a range of uh, hair care, including shampoo bars, conditioner bars. It includes some natural skin care, body care products such as soaps, uh, reusable razors, there's some oral care products in there, like your bamboo toothbrushes, and I have some to demo for you later today. But the core principles are choosing local as much as possible. I'm very conscious about the packaging that is used, and it's something I'll touch on in a minute when I come to how actually I came up with some barriers to implementing the circular economy um, at Green Outlook. Uh, we obviously are very uh, focused on ethics and having a fair wage except when you're a startup business, you don't actually pay yourself for the start. So I think the only person who's being hard done by is me at the moment, but I'm okay, I'll, I'll take the hit for now. And uh, so there's lots of different words like people like to use like eco-friendly products, sustainable products, but really we're, we're trying to build in, you know, a better choice for people rather than going to a mass produced supermarket plastic packaged product, we're giving people a better alternative. So I'll show you some of these products now. Uh, this is your bamboo toothbrush. And it just, it, if every person is using, let's say, a toothbrush a year, or you should be using um, more than one, but uh, that is a lot of waste that's going out uh, and just going straight to landfill. You know, it's not recyclable because it's made of mixed materials and it's going straight to landfill and it really, it's not breaking down. Um, but the bamboo toothbrush is an alternative. Yes, the bristles are still nylon, but this is a significant reduction in the plastic waste. And this bamboo is, uh, it's a very fast growing bamboo and it's not bamboo um, that is uh, eaten by animals. So it's got a better alternative uh, to being used to in production of products like this. Another product then is the shampoo bars that I discussed. So again, they come with no plastic packaging. There's 13 shampoo bars at Green Outlook. Uh, they're all made in Ireland and they have the most amazing scent to them. Um, each of them is very unique. There's ones there. This particular one is rose hip. Uh, if you have um, dandruff, there's ones there if you're struggling with hair loss. Um, and there's lots of different options there as well for oily hair. So uh, it's just something different. And I think like that when I worked in Dublin in 2018, like it's something I'd never really heard of. And it it's only something I, that I came across when I was over in New Zealand. And I thought, well, this is such a clever, you know, product. Like this product, this shampoo bar is two bottles of shampoo in one. All you're doing is taking out the water, taking away, again, it just comes in cardboard packaging or aluminium packaging, taking away the uh, plastic packaging and condensing it down. And again, these are made in Ireland. So you're reducing ultimately the carbon footprint um, of the product. Uh, another product then would be uh, sanitary products so there's lots of reusable sanitary product options and again like 
growing up I knew no different to the regular tampon but there actually is alternatives out there like your organic cotton tampon or the reusable menstrual cup or reusable pads and these are just alternatives that I, I, I wish I had known about earlier but I think that's that thing of as much as we can get the information out there now and start to make these the norm we will have a uh, lesser impact on the environment especially as the population continues to grow so i'll continue for now so i talked about the barriers that i faced then with implementing the circular economy so when i started off i was uh, packaging all the products myself and i was so keen to reuse as much materials as possible i was cutting up boxes and making boxes to fit the size of the order and getting that out to people. Um, but that wasn't ultimately sustainable as the business grew. And also the problem with having an online business is that I can't do refills as such because you know it would be too costly to take products back in, um, like as in a kind of return scheme. And also people can't come to a warehouse facility to top up. So that's just one element with having an online e-commerce shop that prevents me implementing full circularity in certain places. So like I said, like yeah, the online is a barrier, the, the packaging, I had to get boxes. So they're either FSC certified, which is Forest Stewardship Council certified or uh, recycled materials. But I couldn't do what I was doing already and cutting up the supplier boxes or using old papers or magazines because that wasn't sustainable for the growth of the business. And then certain things like the products prevent um, being for fully circular as well. So let's say I have an alternative uh, cotton swab or um, cotton bud, as some people would call it. But there is reusable versions there and they are a plastic reus reusable version. So you would think if you were thinking along the lines of um, making something circular, uh, it would be better if some like rather than taking this, using this, and ultimately, you know, it goes into the compost. The, some people have asked me to get in the reusable version, but really, if a plastic reusable version, like if that lasts you for five or 10 years, that's great. But what if it breaks or what if you lose it? Then there's kind of a bit of a clash there. So it's really trying to, um, so I, I didn't get those cotton, reusable cotton swabs in, but it's trying to find like what are the right type of products and trying to be as I suppose less waste as possible and then also there was some fulfillment logistics which uh, impedes me from again bringing in certain products so I sell this range of vegan skincare and it's the most beautiful vegan skincare and um, they're actually Roseanne would love this they take uh, food byproducts um, such as coffee grinds from uh, cafes, coffee oil, um, apricot stones, and they make them into skincare. And they do this face serum, which is lovely. It comes with the pipette top and it comes in an external carton. So at Green Outlook, all my products are stored at a warehouse and they're all tracked with a barcode. But when I buy this product from the supplier first, it comes in the box with the um, with this barcode and the top but unfortunately their refill option which comes with just a metal cap same bottle a metal cap so someone would basically if they would bought this one they'd be able to reuse their pipette it comes with the same barcode so from a logistics perspective it prevents me from uh, uh, stocking that uh, replacement product so there's just some barriers that currently I've run into when trying to implement um, more circular um, economy in, in Green Outlook. But that hasn't uh, prevented uh, people's love for the range of the products. So currently there's over 180 five star reviews on Google for the products, for the service, and um, people just think it's amazing. And previous to COVID, I used to attend markets and the when people saw especially we talked about earlier um off camera about this being an age thing so obviously we're talking to students today but how older people reacted to seeing a reusable razor and how they talked about how their grandparents or their parents 
had used reusable razors. These are things that were such simple ideas that we got into the habit of taking, making and disposing which are with our disposable Gillette and uh, big razors. But now we're coming back around. So it's almost like um, it is a, a circular again. Um, sorry. So I think I'm nearly pretty much finished. Okay, so then in terms of the sustainable development goals, I suppose like we're ticking off a few of those. Yeah, so we're ticking off a few of those. We're thinking about life below water. I don't know if I'm flicking back. Sorry. I think there's tech gremlins here. <laughs> But anyway, I just wanted to tell you about um, this uh, task force that I'm involved in. So it is the FinBase 2030 task force. So as I said, I am a chartered accountant and it is a joint organize, or joint initiative by the chartered accountants worldwide and One Young World. And they have set up uh, task force. We have a task force in Ireland, there's a task force in the UK, and there's a task force in South Africa. And what we're trying to do is uh, enable the finance and business community um, to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So I would encourage you to check out uh, the link that I have here, and I can get these slides sent out afterwards. Um, so it's Chartered Accountants Worldwide, FinBase 2030. And if uh, anyone uh, who is attending today is um, interested in pursuing um, a role in accounting or if you are an accountant already, or if obviously we're talking to the business school here. So uh, if you think that this is something that you would like to get involved in and you have an interest in um, sustainability and helping businesses to take on um, initiatives uh, aimed at uh, reaching this the sustainable development goals uh, definitely reach out to me afterwards i think that's pretty much it in terms of my presentation really the only thing i would like to say is that if everyone could just look at where you are today so you're either a meat eating gas guzzling you know fast fashion buying traveling everywhere or as much as you can um and that would that i would say that is very heavy on your carbon footprint or on the other end, you are naked and foraging in the woods. Um, just identify where you are on that scale. So previously, like I said, I would have consumed quite a bit of fast fashion. I didn't know at the time, I don't think it had that term fast fashion. I would have had a predominantly meat-based diet. I wouldn't really have cared too much about the packaging that the products I bought came in or the ingredients um, of those products. I didn't think about offsetting my carbon footprint when I flew somewhere, but through time and through education, um, I've definitely been able to lighten my carbon footprint. And I think if we, even if the 50 something people that were on the call today were able to do that, then that would be, a, we would leave the world in a much better place. So I'll leave you with my contact details and I'm happy to take um, any questions. Please do connect with me on social media. I'm even on TikTok. TikTok. If anybody wants to make some TikToks for me, that would be welcomed. Um, and you'll also find the products at Green Outlook. So thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Fiona, for another really insightful um, presentation there. So um, I think we'll just go straight into some uh, into the Q and A section now, and just remember that the chat is actually disabled. So um, please only use the Q and A if you want to send us your questions um, now. So um, just to start off, I I'll just go straight to the actual um, uh, chat that has come from the audience today. Um, I do have a few questions myself that maybe we can get to um, at the end. And um, the first question here, it's for Roseanne and um, one of the audience members is asking, are the broccoli sulfides available from the stalk as well? Yes, they are. And um, the, the, the really healthy components that have all the anti-cancer benefits are still in the stalk. Quite often you find um, 
with plants that the, the woodier parts of it, um, as long as they're green, it tends to be more nutritious, but the woodier parts of it do contain a lot of um, healthy compounds. Can I just show you this quickly? That's what she's Absolutely. Said. Oh, wow. Delicious. <laughs> As you mentioned, you can add other bits to this. So little tiny bits of bacon or chorizo, sunbrush tomatoes, pine nuts. So you can accent it and change it up so you don't get bored with it. But that is a way if you um, would like to eat meat to use it in small quantities to add flavor and just use it in a more judicious way. Okay, yeah. that's done for my cookie demo. <laughs> That looks so good. <laughs> so good. Well, <laughs> <Smell>, cheesy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we just have another question here um, saying thanks for the demo. And can you tell us what is your perspective on the environmental impact of the dairy industry? Okay, when it comes to dairy and beef farming, there are both very hard going on the environment. I don't think that's a, mis that's a mystery, but there is a very good opportunity for regenerative farming when it comes to um, animals like cows that are remnants and um, because of what the manure can actually do to restore the topsoil. So there is the ability to again have that circular economy, but a lot of changes do need to, to happen for that, um, for that to be successful. Um, and there's, there's a lot of good work being done. There's different um, sort of species um, when it comes to say bee farming, different species like Dexter that are being used that have a, a lesser environmental impact. So there is good work being done of it, on it. I just think it's important to stay on top of it and to, and to stay informed with what's going on. Absolutely, okay. Um, and just another question here is, um, is there anything you can do with cauliflower leaves? Yes, excellent question. You can turn it into kimchi. Um, it makes a very, very nice kimchi or um, okay. a, yeah, really good kimchi. The other thing you can do with cauliflower leaves is there's a very famous pickle called pickle lily. Um, yeah. That's a mixture of different vegetables and it's quite heavily spiced and you have to leave it alone once you've bottled it for six weeks just for everything to groove together and to mellow and for the texture to be right, because it's quite spicy to begin with, but piccalilli, absolutely kimchi, brilliant. I've done both and the cauliflower leaf is excellent for both. Okay, um, and just one other question there is, um, so can food packaging waste be combated and everything comes in plastic, so it's hard to avoid, any tips? I would definitely look at as much as possible um, supporting your local smaller shops that have been very active in being packaging free. And that is incredibly successful. And uh, you will see now some of the larger supermarkets, I think purely because of consumer pressure are also starting to change the tune when it comes to packaging. But definitely your smaller, your smaller businesses. I did notice a question, if you don't mind, I'm quickly gonna answer it about the composting or would you like me to leave it to later? No, go ahead, yeah, okay. go ahead there. Yeah because Binbag Stevens spent the year learning about this. I'm gonna share this with you. So unfortunately, a lot of our domestic waste is probably not recycled and processed um, in an ideal fashion, shall we say. So I really, really recommend that people um, compost at home. Now I understand we've all got different living situations, but there's a wonderful Japanese composting system called Bokashi um, and Laura might, sorry not Laura, Fiona might be able to stock this even or supply with it. But Kashi is um, very neat looking plastic drums with a tight fitting lid. You normally get two and then you'll get um, different tools that you need to say push down the food waste. But the most important thing that you normally supplied with is a special bran that's inoculated with microorganisms that will actually break down your food waste. And it was especially designed for apartment living in Japan so that it's very clean, it's not smelly, it's not stinky. And then um, normally the bottom of the, the bin comes away and then you can use that compost. So what I would do with the compost is I would go and donate it to neighbors that have a bit of a garden or if you have a local allotment sort of group. So even if you don't have a use for it yourself, I'm sure you can find it. So it's called Bokashi, B-O-K-A. S-H-I, Bokashi. So I'm sure Fiona knows loads about Bokashi and she can she can help you help you out with that. Okay, um, fantastic. Um, there, we actually have some time to answer some more questions here. So there's just one for um, both of you here, please. So has there been more demand for 
vegan products since the pandemic broke out and um, this person saying I've been vegan for over four years and have definitely seen people becoming more aware how has it been in terms of business and if you're an which is more friendly yeah. <laughs> Perfect. For me, anyway, I haven't seen a particular emphasis on people looking for vegan products, but I suppose on the website, there is a section for um, a section with vegan. So you can just go in and you'll see all the products that are vegan. Um, I'm keenly following um, Singing Step with Podrick on Instagram, who is an older gentleman from County Clare, who is taking on a 21 day vegan challenge. So that's some light watching if you want to go watch that. Okay. Um, very good. And there's a comment here, really, um, and an observation. So this is Fred here in Dublin. Just want to wish you all a happy International Women's Day on the 8th of March next Monday. Um, we need more women in the business world and great talks today. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. And just kind of, I suppose, um, from my own, um, I'm from a marketing background. And um, one of the things that's really, you know, I felt from listening to both of you today, really authentic and very much that you both live and believe in what you do and who you are. But I suppose I was thinking of you, um, Fiona in particular, um, like when, you know, there is also um, a blurring of the boundaries, I suppose, in some ways about how companies as well can market these products and this whole idea of sustainable living as a marketing mm -hmm. tool, nearly as opposed to, um, you know, the, the actual extracting the, the benefits and the good. And I just really felt from both of your presentations today, I loved that really transparent and authentic um, feel that I got from um, both of you. And just, I do think that that can be one way, like within the online business in particular, Fiona, that you can continue through education as well, mm -hmm. rather than just necessarily selling, because there was lots of new little bits of wisdom that I learned um, from the presentations today. Um, so I just kind of wanted to make um, that comment myself. And also from your perspective, uh, Roseanne, I, you know, I myself have been looking at some of these like AI tools. Um, and one of them I've been looking at was the idea of the electronic nose, which I don't know, have you heard of the nose? Um, the text speed that's going off. Yeah, so basically there's companies that are developing these noses that they basically mimic, in you know, the actual human nose and they're going to be part of smart appliances. So they'll be part of your fridge now and they'll be able to detect. Yeah. But when you were saying that really like, that's nearly a reactive strategy as opposed to like a proactive. So it's very interesting way for me to think about things like really preventative measures rather than solving the problems, if you like. I, I agree, oh, and that is my tactic. I, I approach food waste in quite a different manner to, um, a lot of industry professionals would. I really do try to prevent it before that purchase even happens. Um, but talking about appliances, most modern fridges, the salad drawers are what we call biofresh drawers. Mm -hmm. And the humidity and the temperature is actually different within those salad drawers that you'll get about two weeks extra out of your fresh produce. But even if you don't have a fancy schmancy fridge like that, if you even just know which foods, how you and protect them and how you actually store them it makes a massive difference and um, so someone actually said yes um i do have a youtube channel there will be more videos showing people how to do it because i think it is a very practical thing you have to say well this is this thing this is what you do with it um and now with covid i think especially last year not so much people were very concerned about washing and sanitizing everything and i really do understand um that concern i mean in um the food industry we I have sort of plenty of conversations with the Food Safety Authority of Ireland saying HACCP is great science. That is the, the science around food safety, a hazard analysis critical control point system from NASA. And so we need to harness this in a way that we can prevent food waste, that people aren't throwing out loads of stuff because they're concerned that it's gone off. So we need to take the same science and apply it um, mm -hmm. in new and innovative ways. So as we're discussing, knowing how to store things properly, and if you're washing all your produce and then put it in the fridge, it's going to go off much quicker. So yeah. you 
you, you, you think you're solving one issue, but you've actually created another problem uh, yeah. in the interim of doing that. Yeah, yeah. There's just one more question here that's popped up and um, it's for Fiona. Um, what would the price difference between a conventional package um, with a green one be? And do you find them in Ireland or do they need to be imported? So that wasn't a specific product related, it was just in general, was it? And it just is regarding package. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So some products are would be more expensive, um, but you have to take into account like the benefits of that. So you're getting a higher grade of quality ingredients. Um, you're getting that no plastic packaging. It's locally sourced. So I'm thinking there about like the shampoo bars, like they're about they range between 10 and 13 euro. I suppose you could go into deals and get, you know, a bottle of shampoo for a euro. So there is quite a difference there, but then I think they're to... asking Fiona more about the actual cost of the packaging itself. Sorry, um, okay, yeah. okay. So they said, that I um, yeah, it is more expensive. And do you source them in Ireland or your packaging in Ireland or do you import? I the the boxes, I used to get them through the UK. Now my um fulfillment partner uh, gets them gets a selection for me. There is some in uh, Northern Ireland I don't know of anybody particularly within Ireland who has a competitive rate for the boxes the tape then and like the paper tape and the padded envelopes I do get them in Ireland through a supplier called their Echoland on on Google if you want to check them out their Clee paper is their uh, trading name as well I think but yeah they the the price difference in the boxes and particularly when people want delivery to be so cheap it's difficult mm -hmm. because you yeah. have to take that into account so at green outlook the delivery charge is three euro for tracked postage i pay mm -hmm. over at least five euro to on post alone so you have mm -hmm. to take into account um you know the the box the tape the time that it takes to pick them um and everything so yeah it, it's considerably more expensive yeah okay and um a comment here as well um saying a new irish app yuka so y-u-k-a tracks what you're buying and recommends more healthy sustainable options by scanning the barcodes um are either of you familiar with that um, no, I, just, I just saw that now and i'm downloading it mm. and i shall be I shall be here to go for sure. Yeah, I think there's a there's definitely a few apps popping up. I think there's Ethi Cart as well, and there is another one where you can scan your receipt and it will calculate your carbon footprint for you. But I, the name of that one has escaped me right now. But yeah, the the advancements in technology is definitely going to help people, but it will come back to the education base that we have and yeah. um, you know. Um, demystifying I suppose the area of sustainability and making it easier for people you know like uh, Roseanne's like food demos and stuff like getting that information out there yeah I just add to that quickly is because I spent a lot of time doing this uh, researching especially working with universities is that sometimes you are making choices around food isn't necessarily the local the lowest carbon footprint for that particular food but it's for other very good reasons like you're supporting a local farmer or local producer so as long as people can also understand that that there are nuances to it and we do make certain decisions around that and things like at certain times of the year in Ireland we have very very little fresh produce that's available most of it's coming out of cold storage but there literally isn't over the winter months is very very little so we are reliant on importing um, foods at that point so it's just to see the bigger picture and again do some reading attend events like this um you know as fiona's saying is just, just keep up to speed and um mm -hmm. you know do your best to learn about it but without getting overwhelmed because climate anxiety can be a very real thing because it's so much bad news now on top of COVID in the last year that you can get the feeling that what's the point of even doing anything? This is absolutely miserable. The world's going to the hell in the handbasket. So, you know, the, the, the whole comms around it. I know DC actually does a master's in um, climate action communications in the media department. And I think it's very, very needed. And we were talking earlier on about reaching a wider range of people. You know, not necessarily the, the same people that we're talking to, but really a yeah. wider range of people. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, and just um, 
uh, question here. Are there any solutions for the post service food waste in the restaurant industry? Not really. Um, that's why we really need to prevent it. Um, mm. Because from, I'm sure you've heard of the social enterprise food cloud. They repurpose yeah. food from um, supermarkets. And from a food safety point of view, that is very successful. It works really well. Um, they're doing a, an amazing, fantastic job and they've rolled it out to other countries. But once you've actually prepared that food and it's what we call surplus, um, at that point it's surplus. Um, it is very difficult then to actually distribute it to say charities or people in need. And a lot of it comes down to infrastructure problems and um, food safety. So it's really important that we prevent it. Um, also from a composting point of view is that you can't throw everything into the compost because it actually can contaminate um, your whole composting system. So you do need to be really, really careful. Um, because in DCU, um, you can certainly look at traditional composting methods and there are sort of machines that you can use. There's technology that will reduce the food waste into compost within 24 hours. And okay. they are quite expensive, but I also think you are attacking the problem from the wrong end. <laughs> Again, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really yeah prevention. So we need to reverse engineer that. We really yeah. do. Yeah, I think that's a really ex uh, interesting perspective that I've certainly taken away from today. Um, so um, I don't see any more questions. I think we've fairly much covered everything off. Is there any final and concluding comment um, from your end, Fiona or uh, Isa? And we'll just give you find further information and just to get a weekly dose. Um, follow me on Twitter by all means. It's just as at Roseanne Stevens. I'm not that active on Instagram. I will do better. Fiona has a beautiful Instagram. Go follow her rather. <laughs> um, but sign up to my Substack, and in the Substack will be a link to the weekly video. So this week is all about broccoli. So there's a wonderful broccoli pesto, delicious, the salad, and our glorious baked potato. So you'll be very well fed. So sign up to that, and you'll get that in your inbox tomorrow. Sounds fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank okay, you. so just um, I'd just like to thank uh, Fiona and Rosanne for taking the time um, today to give us a really interesting and insightful talk and also to all of you for your participation and your questions. Um, for those interested, the last session of Transform the Circular Economy will be taking place tomorrow and we're delighted to be joined by Mary Cronin, founder of the innovation agency Upthink and president and founder of Host in Ireland, Gary Connolly. So thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you all again tomorrow. And thank you to our wonderful speakers today. Bye-bye.